Welcome to Jewish History Soundbites Podcast with Yehuda Geber. Immerse yourself in the rich tapestry of Jewish history as we explore fascinating tales and uncover hidden gems from our glorious past. Brought to you by our proud sponsor, Cross River, a leader at the intersection of financial services and technology committed to empowering the communities they serve. Cross River's steadfast support fuels our mission to preserve our heritage and foster a vibrant future for all. Contact Cross River through their website at crossriver.com. A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11 Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games. Look at how it's found a breeder in America. So count the shoppers at the ski Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut and loose up. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide. We're together with Jewish History Soundbites, and this episode, a little late by the way, um, because I just came back from a, a trip uh, with a wonderful group from Los Angeles, uh, a shul, had a lot of fun. We went to Germany, Frankfurt, uh, Worms, the whole lower Rhine River Valley, Michelstadt, of course, and then we were in Poland. Did a lot of uh, Poland, Polish uh, Jewish history. We were in the Chelmno death camp. And we were in a lot of Polish Hasidus, Pshischa, Radomsk, Lezhensk, of course, a few other places. It was a great, great group. Great trip. Joey Newcomb was with us. A lot of great ruach and music. So I apologize for this um, episode being a little late. But if you're shul is one of the few shuls that has not done a Europe trip with me yet. You may want to get on board and contact me about doing a trip to Europe, a Jewish journey, heritage, history, exciting, inspirational journey throughout our past and and uh, in the present and future. Either way, this uh, episode is going to be about the early years of the Panavij Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. The Panavij Yeshiva in Bnei Brak is built, was built by the Panavij Rav, base of Shlema Kahanaman. And a, several years ago on this podcast, on Jewish History Soundbites, I made a, a short episode, shortish episode about the Panavij Rav himself, stories about the Panavij Rav. Now I want to focus on the early years of the Panavij Yeshiva, the vision, the dream that he had and built and executed um, by building the Panavij Yeshiva in Bnei Brak, the flagship yeshiva of the entire, um, or most of the Israeli Haredi Torah world. And um, the early years, talk about the 40s, 50s, maybe we'll get into the 60s, not past that. And there are several excellent books about the Panavij Rav. Aaron Sarasky has a classic biography, but there's a much better one, actually, by Shmuel Kohl. I think Sarasky's biography was supposed to be a response to Kohl's book, because um, it was too revealing. Um, there's Rebiel Schwartz has another biography. All oh, this is in Hebrew. I don't know if any of this has been translated into English. Dr. Shlomo Tukachinsky has written a couple of excellent articles on the Panavish Yeshiva in Israel. And the Panavish Yeshiva is an important story because it is, on one hand, the rebuilding of the Yeshiva and the institutions that existed in Panavish Lithuania, pre-war, with the Panavish Rav at their helm, as in his capacity as rabbi of the town of Panavish. So it's rebuilding what was lost in the Holocaust. It's this vision and dream of the Panavish Rav 
of building the Torah world, and it was very unique in many respects that the Panav Zerub had a different type of vision and, and dream than most other people had, and energy and a fundraising capacity. And it's also an institution that it's almost impossible to separate from its visionary and charismatic founder, a base of Shalem Ekanim and the Panav Zerub. And also because the Panav Yeshiva in many ways is a reflecting of the rebirth of the Torah world in general in Israel after the war, and, uh, and, and is reflective of the community that it represents. It became the flagship institution, so to speak, of the Haredi community and its rebirth. So, Panavish Yeshiva really starts in Lithuania, and even predates, there were Panavish Yeshiva institutions that even predated the Panavish Rav himself in the the in pre-war Panavij Lithuania. It was, I guess, even pre-World War I Panavij uh, Russian Empire, kind of. Um, there's the, the Reb Itzel of Panavij, Reb, Reb Yitzhak, uh, Yaakov Yitzhak Rabinovich, the, the uh, first original Panavij, not first, he was the original Panavij Rab. He had what was called a kibbutz of great geniuses who were, it was an elite I don't even know if you want to call it an institution. It was kind of like a chabura that uh, of of elite students that that were that that came to study Torah uh, under him personally, Rabitzel Panavizer. There was other yeshivas in the town. Actually, there was at least two or three other yeshivas in Panavij, uh, one or two of which even predated Rabitzel Panavizer. In other words, there was a yeshiva there for uh, many many years already in the late nineteenth century. But uh, following World War I and the passing of Rabbi Tzalapanavizh, the one who succeeds him in his position as the Rav in Panavizh, is Rabbi Yezif Shleim Mikahanaman, the Panavizh Rav, who had studied in Tells, who had, uh, who had uh, been a student of the Chafetz Chaim and his Kachim, Kyle and Radin, and who I discussed in that episode. You can look at that episode, and hopefully I'll remember to post a link to uh, that previous episode of several years ago in the show notes here. So he builds, he's a visionary, he's energetic, he's charismatic way back then also, and a master fundraiser way back then also as a young rabbi in Panavish, and he builds the Torah institutions of Panavish in the interwar period. Um, he he fundraised all over the world, even at that time, and in the United States primarily, but also in South Africa, which was predominantly a a, uh, a Lithuanian uh, expat community and its Jewish community, and he developed his lifelong love for South African Jews in the Panavish Rav, um, who had had uh, immigrated to South Africa in the late 1800s and early 1900s, primarily from the area of Panavish. They, they didn't just come from Lithuania, they came from mostly from Jamut, from the area of Lithuania, which was northwestern Lithuania, the area of Tels, Panavish, uh, that that area, even Latvia, um, that that uh, region. So the Bonavish Rav felt very close with them, and and uh, and he and and he also fundraised in Western Europe, and and he built up um, not only the yeshiva in Panavish, which was quite a a uh, large yeshiva pre-war, eventually reached hundreds of students. Had a yeshiva katana and a yeshiva gedayla for younger students, for older students. They even had a a cheder, uh, like a, an elementary school, and even a gan. It had a, he had at the front of his room, had a kindergarten as part of his institutions. He had a girls' school, which was incredibly enough called Beis Yaakov, but it was not uh, to not affiliated with the Beis Yaakov in Poland of Sarishnir. It was named Yaakov because the donor's name was Yaakov. Interestingly enough. Um, my good friend Avi Safir wrote a uh, a monumental article based on his years of research about the Philadelphia philanthropist Jenny Miller, um, and she, uh, among the many many other uh, uh, institutions that she endowed, was the Panavish Yeshiva in pre-war uh, Panavish. So she funded that operation, and uh, Panavish Rav had bought this huge piece of property in the center of town where all his institutions were, and he was it was really really an active. Uh, 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 a a building uh, of of various different Torah institutions that the Panavish Rav had dreamt of in pre-war Panavish. And all this is important to the story because it foreshadows what he wants to rebuild. Because for the rest of his life, he would be attempting to be to rebuild what was lost primarily in Panavish, but for but even beyond that in the entirety of Lithuania. Now he, being that he was so involved in first of all being the rabbi of the town of Panavish, which was not a small shtetl, it was quite a large town. He also was one of the heads of Agudas Yisrael in Lithuania 
and was representative of the Agudis Yisrael political party in the Lithuanian parliament. And in addition to that, he was fundraising much of the year in the United States, South Africa, Western Europe, and other places. See, he was never really around his yeshiva, and his brother-in-law, Rabbi Asher Kalman Baron, was the, Rosh Yesh- the active Rosh Yeshiva of, um, of the Panavish Yeshivas. The Mashkiach there for a certain amount of time. Actually, Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz was even there for a very short time in the early 1920s before he returned to Mir. Rezev Leibnednik, the famous Mashkiach of Kletsk, was also in Panavish for a short time. And um, interestingly enough, the one who was the Mashgiach there for quite some time in pre-war Panavish, and this is also important for later our narrative in in uh, in Bnei Brak, is Rav Ram Abba Grossbard. Rav Ram Abba Grossbard was a student of of of, of Kelm of of other yeshivas in pre-war Europe, a great Musa personality, a great tzaddik, a Talmud Chacham, renowned personality, and he is the Mashgiach of the Panavish yeshiva an employee of the Panavish Rav in Panavish, Lithuania, for 12 years, from, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1925 to 1937. I have to double-check that. I didn't write it in my notes. But um, for quite some time, in other words, he's completely affiliated as the Mashkiach of the Yeshiva there. And the reason that's important is because he later on became the first Mashkiach of the Panavish Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. So there's an element of continuity there in the staff and vision of the Yeshiva. So he uh, eventually moved to it was Eretz Yisrael, Palestine. It wasn't Israel yet in the 1930s. So he left, but he eventually would come back when do, to Bnei Brak when, he, uh, when the Panavish Rav would build the Panavish Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. So the, um, the entire edifice, the entire massive experience that is built in pre-war Panavish is destroyed in the Holocaust, decimated completely. Unfortunately, it was a, a total decimation. The Panavish Rav himself, together with his Son Rabbi Avram were the only survivors. They had been on a, they had gone out on a fundraising mission early on in the war, and um, the Panavish Rav's wife and children were killed. Rabbi Asher Kalman Baron and his entire family were killed. The entire Panavish Yeshiva student body and all of its institutions were killed. The entire town Jewish of Panavish, all thousands of them, were all killed. Basically, no survivors, completely wiped out. Everything that the Panavish Rav had and had built was gone. And there was an utter and total destruction of, of Panavish and of Lithuania, Jewish Lithuania entirely. And the Panavish Rav was completely uh, affected by that. And if there's one thing that we can say about the Panavish Rav is that for the rest of his life, he lived in the shadow of the Holocaust. And he never stopped talking about it. And his his zeal to rebuild was always with this, this, this Holocaust destruction in the background, like we have to rebuild, we have to rebuild what was lost, it was always building a monument to what was lost, a living monument, not a, 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 a memorial, a living monument, a living rebuilding, and, um, and that's, that's what he did, that's what he endeavored to do, and that's what he, his vision was, and that's what he eventually did. So the part of his Rav actually arrived in Eretz Yisrael, it's still before Israel, it's still Palestine, in 1940, um, and he's unable to make it back to Europe, um, and he already wishes to rebuild. By the way, I heard a great story. I never verified it, so this is one of those things I just heard, but was never able to verify it, but I, it sounds like it might be true. Um, what is an established fact is that the Panavizhirov's elderly mother um, lived in Tel Aviv at the time. She had moved from Lithuania to to Palestine several years earlier, and she lived in Tel Aviv. And the Panavish Rav's first stop in, in when he arrived in, the, in Eretz Yisrael was to his mother. He lived by his mother initially. I think he had a brother there too, in northern Tel Aviv. And actually, she's buried in Harazesim. I, when I bring groups to Harazesim, so I, I actually show them the Panavish Rav's mother's kever in Harazesim. She's buried um, right next to her is, is Rav, Rav Gustman, so I, I, you know it's right, right there. I show Rav Chaim Kamel a few so they can bury there. Either way, so um, so the Panavish Rav's mother is there. He lives there, and uh, right down the block from where his mother lived was the Chidushe Harim Ger Yeshiva in Tel Aviv. Still is there, by the way, still an active yeshiva, Ger Yeshiva in in Tzvon Tel Aviv, in northern Tel Aviv. So the story is told. All that is fact. Here's what I heard, and I hope it's true, because it's a great story. I, don't, I, don't, I can't verify it, though. Is that The story is told is that one day in the Gary Yeshiva in Tel Aviv, um, someone, stranger, walked in and started 
like speaking to the students of the Ger, the Hasidic students of the Ger Yeshiva in a very active way and learning. He started like, full of energy and he's speaking to them and, 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 and engaging them. And, and he was this incredibly charismatic and energetic individual. And the Ger Yeshiva students were amazed. Who is this stranger? And they went and, and told their Rosh Yeshiva or the Ger Rebbe, whoever it was. I forget which version of the story it was. And that 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 person, either the Ger Rebbe or the Rosh Hashiva or whoever it was, was told, he said, oh my gosh, that could only be the Panevich Yerav. The Panevich Yerav has arrived in Eretz Yisrael, has arrived in the Holy Land. So that he made he made his, his presence known. He was like an unmistakable presence that filled the room wherever he went. Um, so he has, during the war, while everything is going on, while Lithuania is getting destroyed, while his family is gone, I mean, he should have been in mourning and crying and paralyzed and traumatized, and instead he decides that we have to rebuild. We have, he's filled with this mission. We have to rebuild what was lost. Um, and he has this dream um, of, of rebuilding, and, um, and he shares that dream with the Chazinish in Bnei Brak, um, and the Chazanish takes him to, uh, to a window near his house, near his home, and he points to a hill, uh, which is a desolate hill. Today it's the center of B'nai Brak. Um, he points to the hill, which is now known as Givat HaYeshiva, or Givas HaYeshiva, depending on how you pronounce it. And he says, isn't that a great spot for your yeshiva? And the property, the real estate, was originally owned by Chaim Yaakov Halprin, who was a Polish Sadiger Chassid, a wealthy businessman and a close confidant of the Chazanish. He was one of the great builders of Bnei Brak and a funder of many, many Torah projects. A fascinating individual is buried right next to the Chazanish. Um, so he, uh, he, 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 he gets the property, obtains the property, and he wants to build it. And he chooses this location on the hill, and the size, the grandeur, this, this size that made no sense for that time, and the architecture that's designed for the building in a very grandiose way, and it's supposed to be an entire campus with surrounding buildings and dormitories and sister institutions, it really expresses uh, the full extent of the vision of the Panavish Revan. When I go on lead tours, on hist- history tours in B'nai Brak, which, which I do occasionally, but not, not, not often enough. Uh, I would love to do those more. So we go up, you, like, you go up to the, the, the Panavish Rav's vision, you go up to Givata Yeshiva, and you, you see like the grandeur. You're like in awe of it. You know, I, I always point out to the groups, as much as I'm a, I'm a mirror, and I love the mirror, and that's my, my spiritual home, but, but you l- really see the difference between the personality of Rebbe Yudel Finkel and the Pun of Yisrael when you go walk to Mir Yeshiva in Beis Yisrael neighborhood in Yerushalayim, and when you walk up to the Pun of Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. The Pun of Yeshiva, you're walking up a hill, and when you get to the top of the hill, you see like this crown on the hill, this massive building, and it looks so perfectly perched on top of the hill. And the way the building is designed and how you reach it and, and, and has these like surrounding buildings like a circle. And there's, and there's Rababa Grossbard Street on one side and Rabasher Kalman Barone Street on the other side. And it's all Panavish and it's all the vision and the dream and it's all actualized and it's like it's 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 awe inspiring. Whereas if you go to the Mir Yeshiva, you're walking downhill into Beis Yisrael and uh, you bump into one building and you say, "Oh, that's one building in Mir Yeshiva," and here's another building, here's another building, here's another building, and and uh, it, you know it's kind of there. You know it's behind the carpenter shop and uh, you know now it's also behind a pizza shop. Um, so 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 it, it's. It's it's a different grandeur that you know the the Finkels were always very pragmatic, practical people. They got a piece of property, they built a building. They got another piece of property, they built another building. And it's not a criticism at all. Uh, God forbid of the mirror. I would be the last person in the world to do that. But um, it just shows the different personalities. The Panavish Rav had had this vision. Now the groundbreaking of the yeshiva on this hill was without ceremony. Um, it was. During the war, the Panavish Rav himself described the ceremony, the non-ceremony in later years. He he would tell people that the 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 uh, laying the cornerstone ceremony, we did not drink l'chaim, we drank tears. It was during the war years. It was just me and the Chazanish, and all we did was recite two chapters of Tehillim 
and we poured a, uh, a you know a, 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 a you know poured the cement into the cornerstone because that was the entire ceremony. Now it was going to take a long time and a lot of fundraising to build that building. So the Panavid Yeshiva, which he wanted to start right away in 1943, um, it was housed in the Heligman Shul on Rechov Rabbi Akiva in Bnei Brak, which is still a shul there until this very day. That's where the Panavid Yeshiva was located for the first two or three years of its existence before it moved onto its own property. But even after it moved onto its own property, it moved onto that hill, but it was in a temporary building. Um, the the Hanukkah Sabayas, the dedication ceremony of the Panavid Yeshiva building, was not until several years later in June 1953. That's when the uh, building was finally finished. Initially, the Yeshiva had seven students um, when it opened in 1943. Most of the students came from the Lamji Yeshiva in Petach Tikva. And they came along with Rabbi Ram Abba Grossbart. And we, I think he's been somewhat forgotten. His role in Panavish has to be uh, more prominent. And Rabbi Abba Grossbart, like I said, was, um, was the Mashgiach of the Yeshiva in Panavish in Lithuania. And now that Panavish was starting in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, so the Panavish Rav asked him to come along. Now, in the meantime, Rabbi Abba Grossbart was the Mashgiach in Lamja in Petach Tikva. So he c- comes from Petach Tikva and he brings a group of his students with him. I think either five out of seven or six out of seven of the initial seven students were this group that Rav Ram Grossbart brought from Lamja. So he's the one who brings them. And more importantly, Rav Grossbart also brings a rising star who's a Rebbe in the Lamja Yeshiva in Petach Tikva named Rav Shmuel Ruzovsky to be the first Rosh Yeshiva of Panavish. So Panavish, which became the Derech Halimud and the star of, of Panovich for many decades was Rav Shmuel Rozovsky, was also brought by Rav Grossbart from Lamja. Now, this Panovich at this time becomes the first really Israeli yeshiva. It becomes the first yeshiva where uh, the student body came, was drawn primarily from the Yeshuv HaChadash, from the new yeshiv. Um, it was not from the old yeshiv, it was not from Europe, there were Holocaust survivors who came later, but that's a different story. They came to an established yeshiva. This was, you know, this is different than the way Chevron and other yeshivas had been started in 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 uh, in Eretz Yisrael. And this is one of the reasons it becomes the flagship yeshiva. This becomes the new uh, Israeli yeshiva. Um, a couple of years later, Reb David Pavarsky, who had been a Rosh yeshiva in the Lubavitch yeshiva Achit Mimim in Tel Aviv, he was hired to become the second Rosh yeshiva. In, in Panavish, and in 1952, the last of the early big hires was Rabbi Lazar Menachem Shach, who was a Rebbe in the Kletzk Yeshiva in, in uh, Rehovot, and was hired to become the third Rosh Yeshiva in Panavish by the Panavish Rav in 1952. So, but they, that, that was later. The initial staff was the Rabbi Avram Abba Grossbart as the Mashgiach. Um, he unfortunately passed away quite young um, and quite suddenly also, unfortunately, in 1946. So he succeeded, the, or the Panavish Rav succeeded in, in, in convincing Rabbi Leol Yazer Dessler to um, become the Mashgiach in Panavish. And Rabbi Shmuel Rezevsky, as mentioned, was the initial Rosh Yeshiva. So, in the early years, it starts to grow. Um, it, uh, it, 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 it's infused by many Holocaust survivors who come after the war, who want to study in yeshiva. And the Panavish yeshiva, the Panavish Rav, excuse me, is, spends uh, his, most of his time uh, fundraising, like he did before the war, but now even more so because he wants to build the yeshiva and he also wants to build many institutions that he's going to affiliate with the yeshiva. He has far-reaching dreams. Now, one of the, the, the interesting early uh, customs that the Panavish Yeshiva institutes following the establishment of the State of Israel in the Yeshiva is to fly the Israeli flag on top of the Panavish Yeshiva building on Yom Atzmut, on the Israeli Independence Day. And to the best of my knowledge, it continues until today as a, as a, a uh, revered custom of the Panavish Yerav. Uh, whether people agree with him or not, but they can't, uh, they can't, you know, change the custom of the Panavish Rav. But I want to analyze for a minute why he did it. He was once asked, the Panavish Rav was once asked why he did it, because he did face opposition for doing so. And the Panavish Rav said, well, look, I was a Lithuanian patriot when I lived in Lithuania. And because I was a Lithuanian patriot, I flew the Lithuanian flag on Lithuanian Independence Day from my yeshiva in Panavish in Lithuania. 
So therefore, I can be an Israeli patriot when I live in Israel and fly the Israeli flag on Israeli Independence Day from my yeshiva in Israel. Now, that is a, a response. On one hand, it was the, the humor and the, and the, 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 the way the Panavish Rav dismissed confrontation and controversy, which he always did, and he, he never liked to be confrontational. He always liked to dismiss things with a joke. That's on one hand. On the other hand, it's very typical of the Panavish Rav, um, in, 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 a, in almost a way, in a, from a different angle, it might even be considered a a reflection of a mainstream Haredi response to a certain extent, just the Panavish Rav is a drop more liberal or moderate, um, the, or, or it even uh, that that in that in that that they you know they view they view the state of Israel as just the way they viewed Lithuania. It's a it's a country, and uh, it's another country. I can support the country I was in in Lithuania, so I can support the country I'm in now, which is Israel. In other words. They're not going to view it fundamentally as some sort of beginning of the Geula, like a national religious would view it, and they also won't view it as the way a Satmar would view it, as as the antithesis to everything and the personification of evil and and the Tchika Saketz and all that. It's going to be like uh, like a very you know shrugging the shoulders type of attitude, similar to Ger in a way. Others others mainstream Agudist positions. But that's already a topic for another time. But what it does so even more, and this is sometimes overlooked, is that it reflects the moderate and somewhat liberal position of most Litvish Lithuanian rabbis and and Rashi Yeshiva and Sadikim and Lithuanian uh, Torah true masses of the old Lith- Lita of the Jamut region, the northwest Lithuania, where Panovich tells Kelm, Salant, Tavrig, all these other famous towns are. That was a mainstream position there. So, you know, the Panovich Rav is not really an outlier. Um, it's just that it's just that he came from that area, which is, uh, you know, the positions of the rabbis in that area are not so famous anymore. But that was uh, pretty much a mainstream uh, position, as opposed to other parts of Lithuania, such as the Vilna and Minsk regions, or you know, in Poland, Galicia, and Hungary, which had, you know, different positions on these matters as well. So the, the Panovich Yeshiva becomes the flagship of, of, of Haredi rebirth. What's interesting to point out is that with all this, there's also the question of language. Now, the Yeshiva, it was in the, the Shiurim in the, the early years, were all delivered in Yiddish. Um, only switched transition to Hebrew in the 90s, in other words, uh, a full half a century after the, the Panovich Rav established the yeshiva, Rabbi David Pavarsky um, delivered his shir in Yiddish until until his dying day, so he didn't even switch when the rest of the yeshiva switched. So Yiddish, as an old conservative Torah language or Jewish language, was not seen as, as, um, as a contradiction to being the first Israeli yeshiva, uh, and only transitioned later on uh, to Hebrew. Parenthetically, by the way, just to, to add in the uh, side note about how yeshivas transitioned to Hebrew, um, which was there's a famous uh, directive of the Chazanish that Torah institutions in Israel should be in Hebrew. But it's interesting, the first yeshiva to be in Hebrew in Israel was the Kol Torah yeshiva. Now, the Kol Torah yeshiva was established by German Jewish refugee rabbis. Rabbi Chilmach Schlesinger and Rabbi Baruch Kunstadt and Rabbi Yenem Erzbach and others. So, I mean, what, are, what, are you, what other language do they have? Right? They can't, they're not going to have a, a yeshiva in German like they had in Germany because that would be weird to have in Yerushalayim a yeshiva that the shiurim were in German. And they didn't speak, the Yaquis didn't speak Yiddish. Why would they have it in Yiddish? So Hebrew was the only option. So that's, that pioneering move is almost an expected move for Kol Taira. Um, in, for instance, in the Hebron Yeshiva, it was for Yiddish in many years. In fact, the Mashgiach of Hebron, Rabbi Meir Chadash, delivered his Shmuz in, in Yiddish until he passed away in the 90s, in, in 1990, 91, I don't remember exactly which year. In fact, I just heard recently, a couple of years ago, someone told me that when his son-in-law, Baruch Marcha Izrahi, established the Ateres Yisrael Yeshiva, which was not Hebron, it was a break-off of Hebron, and everything was in Hebrew from the outset, and Rameir Chadash became the Meshgiach there as well, he still delivered his Shmuzin in Yiddish, and that was for the simple reason that Rameir Chadash believed that he was a conduit of the Musr Shmuzin of his Rebbe, the altar of Slabatka, and he felt that if he didn't give over the Shmuzin in the original language that he had heard it, then it would be lost in translation. It would not 
retain the authentic feel of what he had heard from the altar. It's a very interesting position um, that Rameir Chadash held, even though everything else in Ateres, and even in Hebron at that point, later stage, was already in Hebrew. That's a completely side uh, point about language. Now, what's interesting is that the Pan of Israel had a very close relationship with one of the leaders, uh, po- political leaders, secular Mapai uh, political leaders of the Israeli Knesset in the early years, Avram Hertzfeld, who was one of the leaders of the kibbutz movement, of the socialist, um, secular leftist uh, um, uh, politics of the early years of the state. And the reason was because Avram Hertzfeld and the Pan of Israel had studied together in Tells many years before. And Hertzfeld was, remained very close with the Pan of Israel throughout his lifetime and helped the Pan of Israel obtain the property rights in B'nai Brak. He helped him fundraise. He helped him get all his licenses and tax things that he needed from the government. He was incredibly helpful. It's amazing that the personal relationship that transcended any ideological concerns. In fact, Hertzfeld, and I don't know if this is well known today either, Hertzfeld, after the Pan of Israel had passed away, delivered a hespit for him and helped fundraise. In other words, he led a, an alumni committee of Panavij to, to continue the Panavij Rav's legacy and help the Panavij Yeshiva institutions and its sister institutions survive and flourish even after the passing of the Panavij Rav. Hertzfeld kind of like stood at the helm of this committee and helped fundraise for Panavij even after the Panavij Rav's passing. Like he really was dedicated to this cause. I think he even attended one of the Archikalas in Panavij. Amazing, and he was completely secular at this point, and one of the leaders in Mapai. Fascinating story of Avram Hertzfeld and the Panavish Rav. Now, the Panavish Rav's relationship with, with the early uh, Zionist and Israeli leaders was not limited to his good buddy Avram Hertzfeld. In the ceremonies um, that were the dedication ceremonies in 1953 when the yeshiva opened, and there was a lot of opposition to who was on the uh, invitation list. So the second president of the state of Israel, Yitzhak ben Tzvi, was invited. And so was the chief rabbi of the state of Israel, Yitzhak Isaac Alevi Herzog, I think the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv at the time, future chief rabbi of Israel, of Unterman was there, uh, Yitzhak Kister, who was a religious um, uh, a member of the Supreme Court, was the MC of the entire ceremony of the Chanukah Sabayas of Panavish Yeshiva, the ministers of the Israeli government um, in the Israeli government at the time, Yosef Berg and Chaim Moshe Shapiro, attended as well. The Israeli flag was flown. The Panavish Rav, when he spoke at, the, at, at this event, he spoke in Hebrew for the first time in his life publicly. Um, Rav Zalman Suratskin also spoke. Um, a bunch of the Tel Aviv Rebbes were there too. By the way, uh, the Sadigar Rebbe, the Mashat Rebbe, and many, many more. And this was a event that drew opposition. There was, there was Pashkevilin written against the Panavish Rav that he invited Ben Tzvi to come to the Panavish Yeshiva. Um, people were against this idea that, the, that people like him were invited and that he was associating with them. Uh, but it didn't really bother him. And the Panavish Rav, with his... Um, with his idea that this was a rebuilding of what had been lost in the Holocaust. Um, so he had um, two psukim that were emblazoned, one on the Panavish Yeshiva building and one on the Oihel Kadashim right across the street from the Panavish Yeshiva building, which I'll get to in a second what that building was. One was Uvahart Siyayin Tia Plate of Ahaya Kaidish, that's on the Panavish Yeshiva building. And the second pasuk, which is on the Oihel Kadashim building, is Vahaya Hanishar B'Tsiyayin Vahanaisar B'Yerushalayim. Kadosh Ye Omer Loi. And both the gist of both of these Sukkim was that the the refugees, the rebuilding will take place in Zion in, in the land of Israel. And, and this was his rebuilding of what had been lost in the Holocaust in, in Israel. And he attributed, I think it was the second Pasuk, actually, not the first Pasuk. I think most sources say that it was the first Pasuk, Kadish, but as far as I know. It was actually the second one, is what the Panavish Rav said that he had heard from the Chafetz Chaim in a meeting with him when he was a student of the Chafetz Chaim, that the Chafetz Chaim, in a prophetic prediction that the state of Israel, that, excuse me, the land, excuse me, the land of Israel, the Jews of the land of Israel would be spared during the upcoming uh, 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 war. Um, and and, uh, and and therefore, that would be the salvation that could be rebuilt the Torah world in Eretz Yisro. Now, the Panavish Ravs uh, built many institutions that were affiliated with Panavish. He built um, um, orphanages, which he called the Batei Avais. He built girls' schools. He built the Panavish Kailal. He built the Panavish Yeshiva Katana for younger students. 
He was rebuilding the Litvish yeshivas. He, his dream was to build 18 yeshivas, which would, each one would be renamed after a decimated, destroyed Litvish yeshiva that had been wiped out in the Holocaust. Everything he did was with the Holocaust in the background. It's very important to understand the Panavish Rav's vision in that regard. And therefore he built Panavish yeshiva institutions in Ashdod, which was a brand new city in those days. He built the Grudna yeshiva in Ashdod, which was named for the Grudna yeshiva. He built the the Vilkomir Yeshiva in Ashdod, which was named for the Vilkomir Yeshiva, where his father-in-law, um, uh, Reb Leib Rubin, had been the rabbi and Rosh Yeshiva. In fact, there's an Israeli joke, and this is just a joke, so hope no one gets offended, um, that the Ban of Jerov didn't live long enough and never was able to obtain enough funds to build all 18 of these yeshivas. Um, but he installed enough Rashi Yeshiva in the yeshivas that he did build that there would eventually be 18 yeshivas one day. That's the joke, okay. So, during the early years, the Panavish Rav spent most of the year on the road to fundraise for all these institutions, and he emphasized, and it's in all the pamphlets that he, that he publishes in those days. There's even a documentary film that he makes about Panavish in those days, that he's rebuilding what had been destroyed in the Holocaust. He creates the idea of the Nitzive Panavish, the people who are going to... They're going to fund the one of his operations. They build a neighborhood. They buy real estate. And one of his fascinating, unique visions that the Panavish Rav had, that to the best of my knowledge, no one else had a vision like this within the Haredi community in those days, was his building of the Eichel Kedoshim. The Eichel Kedoshim is a structure that's across the street from the Panavish Yeshiva until today. And it's the vision of the Panavish Rav to build a Holocaust memorial to the destroyed communities of Lithuania. He built it in 1960. And the architecture of the building was inspired by Yad Vashem's Ohel Yizkar, Ohel Yizkar, which you can see the similar, almost exactly the same structure. You look, look at it today, compare, compare the two. Inside, he wanted to have 700 seats in memory of the, what, he, what he said were the 700 communities in Lithuania that were destroyed in the Holocaust. He wanted to have a memorial to each and every community. He wanted to have information about each community, their rabbis, their size of the community, what was destroyed, which institutions were there, when the Nazis and their Lithuanian collaborators had it wiped them out, and each yard site there would be Kaddish and Mishnaya studied, and he wanted there to be a museum with artifacts. He also brought Sifrei Tyre, which had survived the Holocaust, to be there. He wanted Yizkar books for each community to be installed in, the, in this building, and there would be Kaddish memorials for the days of the massacres of each community. He wanted there to be a cemetery on the outskirts, which would be this memorial for Lithuanian Jewry who never got a burial. He eventually had a different cemetery built, the Nitzive Panovich Cemetery, which is called the Panovich Cemetery on the outskirts of Anebrak until today. That's something else, and it's at a different location. Um, he never got to see the, his plans to fruition for the Ayel Kadesh because he felt that his plans of rebuilding for educational institutions and living institutions and orphanages and for, for building for live people was much more important on his priority list than this museum um, for the Holocaust. And therefore he kept on putting it to the bottom of his list and when he passed away in 1969 the plans were abandoned by his successors and this just remained an unfinished empty building left in ruins for 30 years following the Panavish Rav's passing. Finally in the late 90s um, uh, late 1990s, the yeshiva, which had expanded and boomed, it was, uh, it was really thousands of students by the late 90s, the phenomenal success of Panavish Yeshiva and growth over the years. So the yeshiva decided to, uh, you know, refurbish that building, and instead of having it as a museum, they used it as a base medrash in the Panavish Yeshiva, and that's how it's used until today, and it's even used even more officially uh, in that capacity and t- and today um, after the official what split into two yeshivas in in recent years. So the um, one of the other things that the Panavish Rav obtained in the early years was that he got this Aran Kaidish, this famous gold plated Aran Kaidish from Mantoba, Italy. This was the initiative of Shlomo Umberto Nachon, an Italian Jew um, who was active in Israeli politics in the early years, and he, uh, from a uh, small or extinct t- Italian Jewish community, was able to bring tens of Arayne Kaidish from 
towns and cities in mostly northern Italy, but also central and southern Italy, um, to Israel over the years. And he installed them in various different shuls, mostly shuls, some in museums throughout the country. And one of them ended up in Panovich. So you have the Mantoba, Italy, or in Kaidish uh, in, 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 in the Panovich Yeshiva, which becomes a hallmark. And then the Panovich Yerav institutes all kinds of customs in the Panovich Yeshiva, which eventually spread sometimes to other yeshivas, sometimes not. Um, the he he ha, he had he said the Panavish Yeshiva based Madrish is for is for studying Torah. Therefore, all Shiurim, both the daily Blat Shir of Rav Shmuel Rizovsky and the weekly Shir Kloli of Rav Shmuel, Rav Dabavarsky, Rav Shach, were going to be in other rooms, not in the base Medrash. In smaller Shir rooms, that's where you go for Shir Kloli, that's where you go for the Blat Shir. The base Medrash is for studying Torah. You never use the base Medrash for for a blot shear. He also instituted the Yarche Kala. That would be for Balabatim, for working individuals in the summer weeks when the yeshiva has been Azmanim, and that the Pan of Israel was very dedicated for. He would stop all fundraising initiatives that he had every single summer because he always wanted to be at the Yarche Kala and speak there, and that was in the base Medrash. Um, another fascinating thing I found about the Pan of Israel yeshiva was that in 1962, all employees of the Panovich Yeshiva joined the Histadrut Labor Union of Israel. And till today, as far as I know, they remain in the Histadrut. So all employees of Panovich, like the Ashdod port workers and like the Klalit uh, uh, um, medical insurance and like the railroad workers in Israel, all the unions, the Panovich Yeshiva employees are also part of the Histadrut. The Derech Halimud, the style of learning in Panovich, was mainly formed by Shmuel Rozovsky. Um, Panovich Rav had his input in the early years. Panovich Rav wanted them to study more Masechtas. He wanted the students of Panovich to go through the entire Shas. And he had the, uh, the, the Chaburas formed in the early years of Panovich for that purpose, to study additional Masechtas. He also wanted the yeshiva to go at a quick pace. And in the 1950s and 60s, the Panovich Rav ensured that that took place. So Panovich yeshiva... They covered a lot of ground. They learned, uh, they studied 50, 60, 70 uh, bl- pages of Gemara, Blat Gemara, in each, in each uh, Zman, in each semester of the yeshiva. Went incredibly quick pace. Um, the Rabbanovich also wanted them to study halacha. So there would be a Shulchan Aruch shir delivered every day. Very often when the Panovich was, was around himself, he himself would deliver that shir. Um, all these customs of more masechtas and a quick pace and the Shulchan Aruch halacha shir all petered out eventually after a few years. The Panovich Rav was not able to have them succeed in going for a longer time. Now I want to summarize this story because there's something that I realized myself that I didn't realize before, but I only realized as I was preparing this episode, um, just in the last few days, I realized something fascinating which piqued my interest, which I want to share with you. In many ways, the early history of Panovich can be understood in two contexts. One is the narrow Panovich Arav as an individual, charismatic, visionary builder, rebuilding in the shadow of the Holocaust context. That's one context. That's what I emphasized uh, more in this episode. But there's a broader context here, and that's the story of the development of the Haredi community in Israel context. And Panavish Yeshiva and its three stages of development, which I only focused on the first one in this episode, but if we would broaden our, our picture and look at three stages of its development, it basically, almost to the year, mirrors the development of the Haredi community in Israel's development as a whole, which is fascinating. And I'm just going to go through it quickly. The first stage, which we focused on this episode, is when Panovich is small in number, its student body is small in number, but it has a vision and a dream of the Panovich Rav. It's rebuilding after the Holocaust. And together with that, it also has an overall pretty moderate uh, uh, position on the state, on the building of the state, and sees itself as part of that process. And this is what we covered in this episode. The second stage of, of both Panovich, and, and the Haredi community reflects that at this time, during the 1950s and 60s. The second stage of both Panovich and the Haredi community is is not covered in this episode, is the maturing stage, which is later on, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's when Panovich grows in size and numbers and confidence in self-identity, um, in prestige, and that's accompanied by a a, in, a feelings and in, in, uh, in, in a ideological position of separatism and insularity, which, of course, leads to much more separation from the stage. 
from the state, excuse me, and this stage in Panovich is expressed through its massive growth in numbers and prestige, and it's it's after the passing of the charismatic Panovich Rav, so it gives more space to the employees of the Panovich Rav, the Rashi Yeshiva, Rav Shmuel Rizovsky, Rav Havarsky, but much more so prominently to Rav Shach on the national stage. And this is somewhat of a golden age of the Panovich Yeshiva and lasts from the late 60s to the late 90s. And this is also reflected in how Haredi society is, de- is developing during this time. And this is followed by the um, unfortunate in certain ways, the third stage in both the, in, in the Panovich Yeshiva and to a certain extent also in the Haredi community, the stage of of institutionalization, and and it leads to you know the crisis in Panovish and the well known the dispute, which is what I'm not going to get into now, and that's we're at the end of that stage now. If this was my Shabbos table, actually, not a recorded podcast, I'd make a prediction of the trajectory of both the Panovish yeshiva and the Haredi community for the soon to arrive fourth stage, but I definitely won't discuss it in the framework of this podcast. Just a hint: I firmly believe that history in general is cyclical. So. That's the story of the early years of Panovish. Now, this is Jewish History Soundbites. You can help Jewish History Soundbites by spreading the word about Jewish History Soundbites podcast, telling your friends and family about it. You can also help the algorithm by posting a review or just a rating, um, if you can, on any podcast app. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite podcast platform. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures, and I hope you enjoyed.